Let's continue to discuss imperialism. Today, I can compare and or contrast the types of diplomacy and I can define real politic. The U.S. is very involved in the rest of the world. That's pretty common today. And uh, the imperialist moment in time at the turn of the 20th century really marks the beginning of us being involved in everybody else's business. We'll start with the Russo-Japanese War, Russia versus Japan, 1904-1905. Japan wins a major upset. Japan got lucky. Uh, weather was on their side. They had a little bit better technology. They spent more money. They were actually out of money but ready to lose, and you know, they just caught a break. Whatever. Hey, Japan wins. I'm not going to spend much time on that because this is not Russian history or Japanese history. Either way, America is the mediator. And if you say, wait, who is that guy? That guy looks familiar. Yeah, that's Teddy Roosevelt is the mediator. He wins a Nobel Prize for negotiating the peace. Yeah, he's, he's doing too much, and he will do more by the end of this lesson. Now, his original plan was, hey, let's settle this, and no one really needs to take over any new land. But actually, that's not what happens. We pretty much side with the Japanese, and although the Japanese do not conquer Manchuria, which is modern-day China, and Korea, they do gain those places as part of their economic sphere, and so they can imperialize and exploit those regions for resources, exploit the people, and also gain markets. So Japan pretty much wins. Cool, awesome, whatever. Gunboat diplomacy, we already talked about this. It's the idea of if, if you don't do what we say, then we're going to blow you up. So there's the easy way, which is, hey, Latin America, South America, deal with us. If you don't want to deal with us, well, then you're going to have to do it the hard way, which is through our military. This is gunboat diplomacy, also called big stick diplomacy. Basically, you walk, speak softly. So we will nicely ask you to open up your markets. We'll nicely ask you to allow us to exploit your natural resources. But if the Latin American countries do not do what we nicely ask them to do, then we pull out the big stick. And by force, we make you open up your markets. We make you allow us to steal your natural resources. Real politic or politique, however you want to say it. Government policies, they can, if we want to break them down, maybe we can break it down into two categories. There's practical, and practical, according to real politic, is more important than ideological. So what, what's an example of, maybe you understand what practical means, maybe you understand what ideological means, maybe you don't know what all these words mean. So an ideological way is to come up with a real, almost dream, fantasy policy, something that really isn't going to work, but you would really dream of. It would be awesome if everybody could have something. For example, say everybody gets free college. That would be an ideological policy. We really can't do that. A practical policy would be something within the means of the government, something that the government can't afford, something that won't cause some sort of negative consequences. Like, hey, we can give scholarships for some of the smart students. That's a more practical policy that's well within our means ideological is to make a bunch of promises that you can't afford, that you can't do. Real politic says that, hey, we should probably just do the things that we can do. We need to be more practical in our policies. The government shouldn't make a bunch of promises and, and promise to fulfill all the dreams of its citizens. It should do what it can for the citizens, but it shouldn't make rid ridiculous, unrealistic promises to the people that it can't pay for. So we know that the government has to promote the general welfare. That's according to the Constitution. It's very vague. That does not specifically say what the government should and should not do. A lot of scholars argue over what does this specifically mean. Promote the general welfare. A broad sense is to promote, promote the general good. So for some people, promoting the general good of the country would be free college for everyone. Yeah, that is general good. That would generally be good for everyone. But... Is that going too far? So what specifically does it mean? Does that mean that the ideological point of view or the practical point of view of, well, maybe promoting the general welfare means simply that they should create colleges and give people the opportunity and maybe create some scholarships, but that doesn't necessarily mean the general good should be give everyone free college. Maybe that could cause some problems. You say, well, how could that ever cause problems? Free college for everybody, that sounds like a great deal. Sure it is, but if there's free college for everyone, they have to pay for the college. They have to pay for the universities to build the buildings. That's to pay for the universities to hire janitors to clean the buildings, to put the electricity on in the buildings, to pay the professors to teach the programs. It costs money. So they have to pay for every single student. And the only way that the government is going to be able to pay for those in this ideological policy is to raise taxes. 
So maybe this ideological, maybe this fantasy is not a good idea. Maybe we shouldn't have the government make policies based on far-fetched dreams and wishes. Maybe it would make more sense for the government to be more practical, which is real politic, where the government does things that make sense, that are within their means. So the government could give scholarships that wouldn't cost a lot of money. And they would not have to raise taxes very much. So not a lot of people would have to pay for this program. It seems like a practical solution. And then for the rest of the people, they can take out student loans. We're not going to talk about student loans today. We could spend hours talking about that. But that's a practical policy. That's real politic. All right, back to our ideas on diplomacy. South America during this time, at the turn of the century, the early 1900s, South America is building up their nation and the way that they are building up these nations down here and creating institutions and transportation and militaries, they have to pay for those things. And so they borrowed the money from England. They borrowed the money from Germany. Well, they got to pay that money back. And England and Germany are saying, hey, you got to pay us back. If you're not going to pay us back, then uh, we're going to come and be involved in your government. We may even take over your government, but one way or the other, we're going to get our money. Well, in 1823, way back when, before this time period, the President Monroe issued the Monroe Doctrine, which said that the Western Hemisphere belongs to the West, and Europe is to stay out of that. That was the decree. And if they ever got involved, then America would intervene. If any of these European powers ever tried to colonize South America again, if, if England or France or Germany or the Spain or Portugal wanted to come back and recolonize South America, the North America would intervene and stop that from happening. So the Monroe Doctrine basically said in terms of military events, we will intervene. So don't come over here expecting to steal this land back because you're going to get a war. So that was mainly for war purposes. This is not really war purposes. This is Germany and England wanting the money that they're owed. They loaned money to Venezuela and these South American countries saying, hey, you want to build roads, you want to build bridges, you want to build dams, you want to build school, schools and institutions and build up your country. It's fine. We'll give you the money. But you got to pay it back. Well, South America, these South American nations can't pay it back. So then England says, well, we're going to get that money back one way or the other. That means we're going to have to get pretty involved in your government and your economy because, hey, you owe us the money. Well, Roosevelt creates what he calls the Roosevelt Corollary, kind of a side note or a addendum or an additional chapter to this Monroe Doctrine. And he says it's not just military intervention anymore. The U.S. Help, will help in Latin America or South America for anything, not just military. Europe, stay out. Europe, stay out has been the policy, but that was mainly for militaristic events. Now it's for everything. If you're going to come try to get your money, sorry, here's the rules. You're in the Eastern Hemisphere. Well, you're in this, you're in Europe, but over here in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, it's up to the Americans and you're going to stay out. And if you get involved, we're going to have a war. Basically, we become the world police of North America and South America. We just claim to be because South America didn't appoint us. Brazil, Venezuela, these countries didn't ask for us to be the police. They didn't ask for us to be their daddy. This is very paternalistic where we assume that we are going to take care of North America. We're going to take care of South America. And then America is in control because, again, we said so. No one appointed us, no one approved us, no one said that we could do this, but all of a sudden we just granted ourselves permission to say that we make the rules for North America and South America and Europe stays out. That's what we do, very paternalistic. Moving on with our ideas of diplomacy. We talked about gunboat diplomacy or big stick diplomacy, now we're gonna talk about dollar diplomacy. What is dollar diplomacy? So before big stick diplomacy or gunboat diplomacy, where if you didn't do what we said, then we sent the military in. Well, we're not gonna do that. Taft says we got a better plan, Instead of using force to make you do what we want, here is how we'll get it. Instead of the stick, we give the carrot, as they say. We want you to do, America wants South America or Latin America to follow the policies and the wishes of America. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to give you money. We will pay you to do what we want. So in exchange for doing what we want, we will loan you money, not really give you money, loan you money. So as long as you fulfill the promises and wishes of the American people in your country, then we will give you money. Instead of threatening you, we'll uh, give you a reward. 
sounds good, but the problem is, how's this any different than what was happening before where Latin America was borrowing money from Europe and then when they went into debt and couldn't pay it back, then they had to do what England and Germany want. That was our initial intervention for the Roosevelt Corollary. They borrowed money, couldn't pay the money back. Now they're in debt. Now they have to do what Europe wants. How's that going to be any different than when they can't pay money back to America and then they've got to do what America wants? Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Eventually, they're not going to be able to pay the money back and then we're just going to outright take over or at least the financial institutions and the banks will take control of the government. This is imperialism. This is just imperialism by a different name. Oh, but now we've got moral diplomacy. So this is a new version of diplomacy where we're going to work out relations between two countries. Woodrow Wilson's going to say, imperialism is bad. It's terrible. We shouldn't go into other countries and force them to do what they want or what we want. That's wrong. They're their own nation. They're their own people. They should be able to make their own decisions. Imperialism's bad. Okay, well, but then he says, but, 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 hold on, there's just a little but. What happens if one of these nations is ruled by an evil authoritarian dictator that's suppressing the people, oppressing the people, and taking away their rights. If you have an evil dictator controlling one of these countries, well, then it is our purpose and it is our responsibility as world police and as the paternalistic nation that we are to intervene and spread democracy. So it's okay. Imperialism is bad unless... Like, it's bad to take over other countries. It's bad to exploit their natural resources and steal their resources. It's bad to open up markets so that we make a bunch of money. Unless we're also spreading democracy and teaching them the ways of our democratic institutions. Where have we heard this before? Oh, yeah, that guy said, hey, it's okay to blow up countries in the Middle East. It's okay to open up those markets and make money for multinational corporations because we're going to teach them how to create a democracy. It's okay to get involved in Middle Eastern countries and Northern African countries because, look, we're not bad guys. We're not trying to steal from them. We're trying to spread democracy. Well, that's what you say, but that's not necessarily what happens. And to wrap up our imperialistic activities, again, through moral diplomacy. Remember, again, we morally are allowed to intervene when bad stuff's happening. If a bad dude tries to take over a country, then it's America's job to get involved. So Mexico is having a revolution and Pancho Villa is leading this revolution of the people against a regime that the people didn't necessarily like. Well, Pancho happens to go over here into New Mexico and kill 16 U.S. citizens. So then we say, hey, mm -mm, again, we're allowed to intervene if we think bad guys are doing bad stuff. We are morally obligated to get involved. And so America decides we're going to get involved in this Latin American country. We send Blackjack Pershing to go hunt down Pancho Villa. And as he is getting close to Pancho Villa, World War I breaks out and we have to call him back. And so Pancho Villa gets away. I mean, did we really need to get involved in the first place? Pancho Villa, pretty crazy dude, but it's another nation. It's another country. Every time there's a bad guy in another country, does America have to get involved? Well, sometimes it seems like that's the rule. And that was going to be the policy here. We probably would have hunted down Pancho Villa until the end of time. But World War I happened, and so we had to pull our soldiers and send them over to Europe. Compare and contrast the different types of diplomacy, gunboat, big stick, moral, dollar. You know, you could say they're different. But they're all the same thing. It's imperialism, folks. We're taking over other countries, exploiting their markets. And it was real politic. What's making government policies based on practical plans instead of fantasy and ideological. Everybody gets free chocolate milk. You might have heard that recently.